Okay, so the final thing I'm going to do today, I'll try to get it done in 10 minutes, but I'm not promising, um, is to devise the new transformation of space and time. Okay? We said that the Galilean transformation is no good. It's not consistent with the constant speed of light. Okay? Um, and we also said, you know, these length contraction, time dilation effects do not agree with the Galilean transformation. Right? Galilean transformation assumed no length contraction, no time dilation. So therefore, we need to ask, well, what is the correct transformation of space and time? Right? How do I relate coordinates as measured by one observer to all coordinates as measured by the other observer? Okay. And you can do it, and that's what I want to do now, and the transformation you get is called the Lorentz transformation. So this is the transformation of space and time coordinates between different observers once you take into account these effects with the correct values of alpha, beta, and delta. Okay. Okay, before I do that, it's useful to define the following constant gamma, which is equal to 1 over beta, which is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. That's just a definition which is used a lot in special relativity. Just believe me on that. So, the, again, we're going to do a kind of thought experiment. Two observers, S and S prime, measure the position. is x or x prime, and time, which means t or t prime, of something. Of an event. Okay, so event is just a general term. Something happens somewhere in space, and two different observers measure the position at which it happens and the time at which it happens. Okay, doesn't matter what it is. Okay. Right, so both observers need to measure position and time. So in order to do this, they both need to have a ruler and a clock. So the setup looks like this. <coughs> I'll draw everything from the S perspective. Now that we've fixed alpha, beta, delta, one perspective is enough. So he has got a ruler okay, to measure length. And he's got a clock to measure time. Okay? The S prime observer likewise has a ruler to measure length and a clock to measure time. But according to the S observer, the S prime ruler is contracted and his clock is time dilated, going slow. So that's the original situation. Now something happens at time t. So at time t, what does the same situation look like? So here's S again. Okay, he's got a, a long ruler. Okay. Okay, and he's got a clock which is measuring the time t. Right? Now, he sees an event at position x, okay? So, on his ruler, something happens over here, and he measures the time at which, it, the position at which it happens, and it happens at position x. Okay? So, that's it for s. Now, s prime, in the meantime, s prime has moved, right? So, s prime will have moved somewhere over here. And he's got a clock here. And his clock will be measuring the time t prime, which is beta times t, time dilation. Right? And his ruler will look like this. And he is moving. And he needs to look at his ruler and see what position he measures here, x prime. 
Right? So we'll do positions first and then we'll work out times. Okay, let me call this one t prime 1. You'll see why in a minute. Okay, right. So first of all, what is x prime? Well, the distance between the edges of the rulers here is equal to the speed at which he travels, which is u, times the time for which he has traveled, which is t. Right? So this distance here is ut. So this distance here is therefore position x minus ut. So you might think, therefore, comparing these two, that you'll get x prime is equal to x minus ut. Now that's what the Galilean transformation thinks it is, but that's not right because the ruler is length contracted, right? And if you try and imagine, suppose that I'm measuring a distance of two here on a normal ruler, okay? Then on a length contracted ruler, all of the dots are squished up together, so you'll measure a bigger length, like three. Okay? So because the ruler is contracted, the distance you measure is actually bigger by the inverse factor. Okay? So therefore this will be this divided by beta. Okay? Because the ruler is contracted, the distance you measure is bigger by the same factor. Okay? So 1 over beta. And as I've defined, 1 over beta is what we call gamma, so therefore this is equal to gamma times x minus ut. So that's the first equation of the Lorentz transformation. It tells you how does the measurement of position of s prime depend upon the measurement of position of s. Okay? And it's exactly the same as the Galilean transformation, except for this parameter gamma here. Right, so now we need to do the same thing with time. Time is a bit more tricky. Let me go through it slowly. Okay. The reason time is tricky is because it's not simple, it's not this simple. T prime is beta times T, right? It's not, that's not the right answer. The reason it's not the right answer is because S prime needs to measure the time of this event over here. Now in order to do that, S prime will need to have a second clock at the position of the event, right? So he will need to have another clock here. Right? In fact, S also needs another clock here, but according to S, his clocks are synchronized, so they show the same time, so it doesn't matter. Right? But according to S, the S prime clocks will not be synchronized. Right? The second S prime clock, sorry, this diagram is getting rather crowded. The second S prime clock will show a time, time T2 prime, which is equal to T1 prime, and then this one is ahead, so it's behind in time, so minus delta. Okay? So therefore, the time that S prime measures for the event, which is T prime, which is T2 prime, as I've called it there, right, is equal to, going on the diagram, T1 prime minus delta, T1 prime is just beta times T, as we've said. Okay. And what's delta? Delta, I rubbed it off. Okay. Let me write it up here. Okay. The formula for delta was it was equal to U times L divided by C squared, where L is the distance between the clocks in the rest frame. Okay. So in this case, L here is x prime, the distance between the clocks. So this is beta t minus u over c squared times x prime. Okay. So this is beta times t minus u over c squared. You put in the formula for x prime, which is gamma times x minus u times t. Okay. So now we need to simplify this equation. 
Okay, I'll, I'll go backwards. Okay, so I, I'm nearly at the end, so I think 10 minutes was about right. Okay. So, what's this? Well, let's put the T parts and the X parts separately. So the T parts, I've got beta from here, and then from here I've got plus gamma times u squared over c squared. Okay? And the x part is minus gamma times u over c squared. Now I use a cunning trick. We defined that gamma was just 1 over beta, right? So therefore, beta times gamma is just equal to 1, right? Gamma was defined as 1 over beta, so beta times gamma is 1. So I can multiply by 1 here. In other words, I can write this as t times gamma times beta squared plus u squared over c squared. Minus the same thing. So what I've done is I've multiplied the first term by beta times gamma, and that allows me to take gamma outside. Okay? And then last line, beta squared, if you look at the definition, it's just 1 minus u squared over c squared. Okay? So therefore, the u squareds over c squared nicely cancel, and you get that t prime is equal to gamma times t minus u over c squared x. And that's it. That's the end. Okay, so just let me write it up. Summary. So what's the Lorentz transformation? It says that x prime is equal to this factor gamma times x minus ut. And it says that t prime is equal to gamma times t minus u over c squared times x. Okay, so in this class I just want to mention a few more properties about the Lorentz transformation. So this is the transformation we've seen in the last couple of classes. Um, and remember, it relates the measurements of coordinates, that's space and time, between two different observers with different velocities. So we imagine that there were the observers s and s prime, and the s prime observer is moving with speed u relative to the s observer. Now, the first thing I want to say is that the equations as written it here assume only one spatial dimension, right? We've only got the x-coordinate, which is the direction of relative motion between the observers. Um, and in reality, we know that space is three-dimensional, right? Um, and therefore, we should ask what happens in the y and z directions as well. In other words, what happens to measurements of distance perpendicular to the relative motion between observers, okay? Um, and the answer is quite simple simple as it could possibly be, really, that nothing changes. So the measurements in the y and z directions of both observers are the same. Okay? So that's the answer. Um, let me explain why that's true, why that must be true. The, the meaning of this statement, that y prime equals y and z prime equals z, is that there's no length contraction effect perpendicular to the motion. So I use this little symbol here to mean perpendicular to. Okay. So there's no length contraction effect perpendicular to the motion. That means that when these two observers take their rulers or whatever to measure distance in the y direction, they measure the same thing. Okay. So how do, how do I know that? How do I know, how do we know that there's no length contraction in the y or z directions? Well, this is actually implied by the postulates of special relativity 
Um, and you can see this through a thought experiment. So let's suppose that there was a length contraction effect. Suppose there is a length contraction effect. in the y direction. Then you can imagine doing the following experiment. You have the observer here, S prime, and then you have the observer here, S. Okay? And you give each of these observers identical rulers with the same length. So the S observer's ruler is here. And you give the S prime observer an identical ruler, but because he is moving and because there is a length contraction effect, his ruler will appear shorter. So from the S observer's perspective, the S prime ruler will be shorter. It's shorter than his. And of course, the S prime observer and his ruler and everything is moving this way with speed, U as usual. Now, if you start with this initial setup, then at some point in time, the S prime ruler is going to cross the S ruler. And at this point, we can make a measurement. What we can do is on each edge of the ruler, we can put some kind of knife or cutting blade or something that will meet, make a mark as the two rulers pass each other. Okay? So as the two rulers go past each other, um, one ruler will make a mark on the other ruler. So as I've drawn it here, Because the S prime ruler is length contracted, as it passes the S ruler, it will mark it. Okay? So at the end of the experiment, you will find the following. You'll find that the S ruler here has got two marks on it where it was cut by the S prime ruler as it went past, but the S ruler is not, sorry, the S prime ruler is not cut, right? Because the S prime ruler was length contracted, so therefore it misses the, the blades on either edge of the S ruler as it goes past. Okay? So at the end of the experiment, the S ruler is cut, but the S prime ruler is not cut. So, okay, fair enough. The problem is that we have the principle of relativity, right? And the principle of relativity says that if I do the same experiment but shifted by u, that basically means doing the same experiment from the S prime observer's perspective, then the results should be the same. Okay? But if we consider this same experiment from the S prime observer's perspective, It's obvious that he won't agree about this, right? Because the S prime observer will see his perfectly normal ruler here, and he will see the S ruler here, length contracted, and moving towards him. And therefore, from his perspective, as the S ruler comes past, the S ruler will cut the S prime ruler and not the other way around. Okay? So at the end of the experiment, what you find is that the S ruler is not cut, but the S prime ruler is cut. Um, 
But these two results are in contradiction with each other, right? They can't bo possibly both be true at the same time. The S observer thinks that his ruler should be cut, and the S prime observer thinks that his ruler should be cut, but they obviously they can't both be right. This is an inconsistent result. At the end of the experiment, either the rulers are cut or not, and they must agree on whether the rulers are cut or not. So these two results contradict each other, um, and the only way you can resolve this contradiction is by saying that, in fact, our assumption here was faulty. In other words, there is no length contraction in the y direction, and the two rulers are identical as they go past each other. So, so this result here and this result here are in contradiction with each other. It means the original assumption of length contraction um, is unsustainable. Okay? So this contradiction here implies there must be no length contraction. Okay, so that tells you that there's no length contraction um, perpendicular to the direction of motion, and that means that the y and z components of the Lorentz transformation are simply that both observers measure the same distances in the y direction and in the z direction. Okay, so these four equations here then, x, t, y, and z, are the complete Lorentz transformation, okay, in three-dimensional space plus time.